oligometastatic disease, how do we define it? And you know, it's sort of interesting, there are lots of different ways that one can do it, less than three, less than five, you have primary intact, you don't have primary intact. And you know, one of the things I'll emphasize a little bit is what you already know, and that is, you know, imaging is completely key. You know, old versus new, it's just like a different paradigm when we talk about new imaging and old imaging and oligometastatic disease. Some people have thought about it as an intermediate state, of metastasis between localized and widespread metastasis. And there's a little bit of data to suggest that it could have a biologically distinct region within these cancers. So it's a one that could metastasize slowly, but then there's also clearly others that it's really just different in time. So there's a little bit of biology that could come into play. And then there's some time differences that could come into play. So I, I thought I would start off by talking briefly about death after surgery. This is from the Egner article that's really nice and in multi-institutional studies. And you know, what we're seeing here is really death, I'm going to call it micrometastatic here because we don't know what it was. You know, these are very good centers that entered patients into this long-term study, and I'm certain that they were staged. And yet, look at the mortality for these high-grade cancers. And if you're a young man and you're getting surgery and you're more likely to die during the next 15 years from prostate cancer than anything else. So that's pretty dreadful. And obviously, some of these patients might have been oligometastatic. We just don't know because this is really where we don't know based on old imaging. So it's important to understand patterns of spread, but I won't go into it a lot. We could look at the autopsy studies. So basically, 100% of patients have involvement in the bone, whether or not you can see it or not. If you go to micrometastatic, you start looking at it under the microscope 100%. But one of the things that has been influential to me, at least in my thinking, is the Tin Man study, which is, I think, already appeared in five slides so far in the last, um, what is it, 18 hours or so. And pretty remarkable to be able to trace the evolution of metastatic disease and to see the extent, not only of the clonal heterogeneity that can arise, but also the fact that metastasis can give rise to other metastases pretty commonly. In fact, is it's sort of the escape prisoner concept. Once that prisoner got out of jail in the first place, he's probably going to learn how to escape and escape and escape, and he's out there doing it. So if metastases begat metastasis, then I think there's an additional rationale for the eradication of early metastatic disease. But then, hey, we've got this primary down there too, and it's still can serve as a nidus for additional metastasis. So probably need to get rid of everything, eradication. That's what we need to do, eradicate it. So nodal spread, and this was mentioned a bit earlier in the very nice surgical talk this morning by Dr. Linehan, it really doesn't have a sentinel pattern. And this is a little bit confusing because what happens is that surgery as done today, even the extended lymph node dissection, if I caught it right, is only catching about two thirds of the nose. So there might in fact be a survival advantage for an extended over limited dissection. But nevertheless, we're still missing a pretty fair amount. And the problem is that you just can't see these boogers. They're, they're too small. And if you, you look at it, 68% are smaller than five millimeters, 70% not detected with current imaging, any current imaging, 41% in this particular study not detected by PLND and in terms of long-term follow-up. And get this, more than 50% in the pelvis are actually outside the external beam radiation typical fields. So goodness gracious, you know, I mean, we've got local regional disease here and we're still not into eradication. So this fellow right here is sort of thinking about it, you know, with this new imaging, I can see better now perhaps. And how much you find depends on how you look. And if you're contemplating that you want to eradicate these sort of oligometastatic sites, then you kind of have to know where to go. And we have to acknowledge that micrometastases will never be imaged. And by the way, there's a study that I didn't show here, but it's a cool study. If you go back to Paul Lang at the University of Washington, they did a whole series of bone marrow biopsies at the time that they were doing the radical prostatectomy. And a huge percentage of patients actually had evidence when you look very, very closely with PSA and histochemistry of disseminated cells, but very interestingly, not all those cells went on to metastatic disease. In fact, there's a number of the cells seem to have sort of shed 
without proliferating and going forth. Perhaps that KS67 has something to do with it. Bone scans, CAT scans are not up to the task. Sodium fluoride PET, obviously a little better way to look at bone. PSMA PET, uh, Dr. Ryder in the back, he knows a little bit about that. Choline PET, uh, Eugene Kwan and a bunch of folks up at Mayo know a lot about that. MRI, diffusion weighted imaging better. Combidex not really being done. Combidex got screwed up by the company and did not get FDA approval. It actually still is a good test and can add value. So this is second generation PSMA PET at Hopkins using the low molecular weight um, binder. And uh, we don't exactly have all the comparisons here, so I don't know exactly what we're showing with, with what technology. But the truth is that when you use a PSMA PET, you see more. And perhaps a patient who was scanned negative before now has oligometastatic disease, or perhaps they have disseminated disease, and you wouldn't call it oligometastatic. I'm not really sure. So there's some European studies that have looked at Comidex MRI and choline PET and worked at some comparisons. And it turns out that the choline PET is definitely good, median node size about eight millimeters for the ones that were detected, the Combidex picks up even more, and here you're seeing 151 positive lymph nodes in 23 patients versus 34 positive lymph nodes in 13 patients, same 29 patients. So anyway, you know, the more you look, the more you find, and the different technologies all bring different things to the table. Um, another gadolinium PET in this case, and looking at sensitivity and specificity, the median size of the missed nodes on careful analysis was 4.3 millimeters. Okay, just tough to pick up those little nodes. The median size of found nodes was 13.2. So results, by the way, are about equal to choline PET. So PISMA PET and the choline PET, at least with this technology, appeared to be morally equivalent. So then we start to ask some additional questions. Like one I posed earlier, if we're trying to eradicate metastatic disease, well, what about that disease is still in the prostate? So you know, what about the data that might suggest that removal of a primary in the face of metastatic disease makes sense? And I just want to cite for a bunch of people who may not be GU uh, medical oncologists that removal of a renal primary in the face of metastatic disease, at least in the interferon era, provided level one evidence from a large prospective trial that removal of the primary in the face of metastatic disease was a smart thing to do. Now, we're debating that today because it wasn't in the TKI era and certainly not in the PD-1 era. But there's some pretty good rationale for trying to remove the primary. And there's some retrospective analyses that suggest improvement, and there always get to be these issues about, you know, the worst prognosis, patients, et cetera, et cetera. But there's some retrospective data that suggests improvement. And you certainly have less issues with local symptomatic progression. Sometimes that happens when it does happen, it's most unpleasant. I just had a patient die recently. Um, lethal prostate cancer, defined in various ways, can persist in primary tumors after systemic therapy. And you know we might even be altering tumor biology. So there's some pretty good reasons to do it, but there's not a lot of data. Now this actually is a recent piece of data from Axel Heidenreich uh, over in Germany. You may or may not know that in Germany, the urologists pretty much handle all prostate cancers start to finish. The medical oncologists don't even see the patients. They're very aggressive, and here, if you look at patients who were oligometastatic, low-volume skeletal metastases, they actually had a prolongation in time to castrate resistance for those individuals who had their prostates removed. So, you know, perhaps interesting. I have to say we need more data, and we're probably going to have more data coming, because trying to be able to treat the primary in the context of metastatic disease, I'm leaving oligometastatic just for a second, but the Stampede trial has brought in an arm that looks at treatment of the primary. HORAD, which is a European trial, predominantly Dutch, has already accrued, and MD Anderson's got a big trial going on. These are METs in general. And then there's the trombone trial, which is radical prostatectomy in men with oligometastatic disease. I call it the amazing Stampede trial because, you know, I think it's such an amazing trial and has already been contributory. And if you look down at the bottom here uh, on H, ADT plus radiation to the prostate in newly diagnosed M1 disease. So they're building it in as an arm and going to determine whether or not in this particular setting 
there's an advantage of treating the primary. Horad completed accrual, not restricted to oligomets, but the bottom line is going after the primary and being able to look, and this is an overall survival study, there are 446 patients on this study today. Another question to ask is, does treatment of metastases alter the natural history in those of metastatic disease? And clearly, if we leave prostate for a bit, we have strong data with regards to sarcoma, oligomets, and, and colorectal cancer. I mean, if you have a sarcoma and you're metastatic, you do it. I didn't really talk about, but probably should at least mention renal, where the truth is, if you have a renal cancer and you have oligomets, I typically try to get them taken care of, chop them out if, if feasible. Debulking of peritoneal lesions in ovarian cancer standard of care. For prostate, we just don't have that much data. Though we do have some data. It was showed a few moments ago with SBRT to oligomets. And there are a variety of, of analyses that have been done. But the bottom line is, I think what it does is sort of kick the can down the road. If you're using SPRT for, for METs, it can take you a while before the disease catches up. And whether or not this is due to eradication of what you see that is therefore pre preventing the subsequent metastases or something else, I'm not sure. But the bottom line is, is, is you can actually treat people with SPRT. You can delay ADT. You can potentially delay time to CRPC. You can potentially delay time to other subsequent metastases. Now, there was a slight mention this morning in a single patient about salvage lymph node dissection. And we saw a video. And Eugene Kwan, and I've, I've, when he published his paper, there were a lot of details missing. Like, uh, Eugene, how many patients did you scan to find the 52 that you operated on? And he, he said, well, I don't know exactly, but it's about three or 400. So he scanned three or 400 patients. He found 52 who had oligomets to the pelvic lymph nodes, and he operated on them with a salvage lymphadenectomy, total lymphadenectomy. And it turns out that about, what is that? Uh, two years later, about 50% of the patients had not progressed by PSA. 50% of the patients did. So he's hopeful that if he takes three or 400 patients, he can find 52, and he might be able to have a major impact on the PSA progression in about half of those. There are a whole bunch of oligometastatic trials. You can look at that in terms of SBRT and immunity. You can look at it in terms of uh, immune endpoints. You can look at various ways of doing it. You can use ADT with it and lots of different ways. I, I, I do like the memorial trial, which has an endpoint of an undetectable PSA with a non-castrate T. You know, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Walt that when you castrate men, there are a bunch of bad things happen. And if they don't have a castrate T and they don't have any PSA, I like that. So are we looking around for those radiation immune interactions? I think so, because we've already talked about them. And, you know, radiation comes in a lot of forms, you know, EBRT, SBRT, radium, samarium. And yes, there are samarium trials right now going on at the, the NCI in terms of follow-up. Immune therapies are different, CYP-T, PROSFAC, anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here now, and I won't summarize it other than to say there's a lot of stuff going on. So how do we approach oligomets today? I think we have a lot of latitude, but we don't have a lot of data. Um, I think, and I didn't put this on the list, if you have pelvic lymph nodes, that it's conceivable that a salvage lymphadenectomy could potentially be feasible with the right imaging in the right patient. So that's something to consider. And then if it's more widespread, you know, maybe the Stampede trial would convince us in combination with Charted that we ought to be giving ADT plus docetaxel. And maybe the EBRT data says we ought to be given EBRT. So maybe we do all the above. And then maybe we just need to do ADT plus EBRT or SBRT, or maybe we just need ADT plus docetaxel, or maybe we just need ADT, or maybe we just need the SBRT, or maybe we just leave everybody alone so we can just let the old men just die of their own natural causes, right? You know? And by the way, there's a lot of judgment that could go into this, and yes, that 99-year-old dialysis patient and the 55-year-old marathon runner, they are not the same. And I think it's kind of something for everybody. This is sort of the Wild West right now. 
Um, I think you can probably do almost anything you want to do and have a justification for it, but I'm not sure we're going to be making a lot of progress until we get our trials together and try to have a lot of fun. So uh, if you want to go to lunch, you can go to lunch. If you want to ask a question, you can any, ask a question. Yeah, any questions for all of them? Please do. Thanks. So I, I don't know what happened that the slide didn't pop up this morning, but there's actually been about four different studies that didn't demonstrate some biochemical advantage to doing the salvage lymphadenectomy. There was one just recently in the Journal of Urology as well. But again, everyone's only seeing about 25 to 40% uh, with the salvage technique. So now, now one, one of the things I thought that differentiated the Mayo series was the utilization of choline PET in everybody and defining with advanced imaging the candidates. So he right. winnowed it down from three to 400 to 50. So let's just say 400 to 50. Only one out of eight patients with a recurrence would have been operated on. So that, I thought, made his group a little bit different. Right. They didn't do that in the Italian study. You had the other one that was just released in the Journal of Urology as well. That's correct. So hey, some, okay. some of those patients were found by MRI, not by the PET choline in the other studies. Yeah. So, so we, we have more work to do. We do have more work to do. Thank yeah. you. Great. Thank you. So in that study, um, when they operated or did the total pelvic dissection, how many more lymph nodes are positive other than the ones that were visualized by the choline pad? Ooh, I wish I could remember that. Um, but it, w it was definitely more than one. And, and initially when they were doing this at Mayo, uh, at least starting to Eugene Kwan, they were doing kind of plucking the nodes, and that never worked. So if you just go after the single hot node, that never seemed to work for, for the pelvis. But I, it's a great question. I'm sorry, I can't, can't answer it. So when prostate cancer leaves the primary from the prostate stroma, that prostate stroma is AR positive, and it's doing a lot of really good things, even if the androgen receptor is driving growth of the actual you know, cancer locally. Mm -hmm. And so the first really foreign stroma it hits is like a lymph node. And so those cells there have got a co-op basically the microenvironment they basically came from. In other words, and we now know that if you stain for androgen receptor in lymph nodes and METs, they're AR negative. Really? Yeah. So the, I was not aware of that. Yeah, that's, it's that's very, very, very reproducible very fine. Yeah. And so what hap what's happening is that the androgen, that the cells are actually going and be, they're essentially being partnered in, in the local cancer. The stroma has to help them. But as soon as they get to a lymph node, if they're going to go any further, they have to basically become independent of the stromal AR. That doesn't mean that when they go to a new place, they might have to pervert it and make that stroma do things to help it. But at least it doesn't require that stromal to express AR. Mm -hmm. So what I've always wondered is whether or not essentially lethal prostate cancer is never from the primary. That it always has to come from essentially almost like a T cell getting educated in the thymus, the lymph node, even if it isn't sitting there expanding clonally. It's essentially turning over mm -hmm. until it finally gets the right solution. So this idea of taking out individual lymph nodes has always seemed to me like a smart thing. <laughs> it would be like prevention. And so one of the things, I, I, I've been in this field since 1977, and the thing that keeps getting me now more and more as I get older is every man on the earth is going to have some histological changes in their prostate if they live past the age of 50. And we, we know that the vast majority of those men will never get any symptoms from prostate, nor will they die from it, okay? So prostate cancer ought to be the most preventable cancer going. It's got these genetic lesions, but it takes a long, multiple decades to grow. It probably has to go to a lymph node to be educated to kill you. So one of the things that we're going to start to think about more and more about this is the idea about would lymph node dissection actually be a surgical chemo prevention? Don't try to do it as therapy. It's the idea that that was the microenvironment that would be potentially educational for the cells that will eventually, if they get there, go out and kill you. So I think that we almost need a new vocabulary for this. The so-called natural history of prostate cancer, we're assuming is like in the primary. But I would suggest that that's where it has to start. But if you go back to Steve Bova's studies, one of the interesting things are there were cells that were in lymph nodes and other mets that went back to the prostate. Mm -hmm. So they could actually metastasize back to the prostate. So it's not all from the primary out and then it's worse. 
So there's something about the host again, you know, has to actually be involved with allowing or modulating. So I do think that some of these technologies we're talking about, about reduction, it, it may be if we're trying to use them as therapies, they're going to be a hard sell because then you got to show that you've cured the person, right? But if you use the word prevention, then what are you talking about? So I want to ask the radiotherapist for a minute <laughs> because we heard about essentially very focused radiation. Is there any possibility that you could irradiate the lymph nodes in a patient that have, for example, like Gleason 6, a small volume Gleason 6, just to irradiate the pelvic lymph nodes and call it a day? In other words, <laughs> let that person go and see what happened. I mean, with the stereotaxic kind of approach, could you do that? <laughs> I, I think I got the, just the question. So I guess, yes, we can always treat the lymph nodes. The real question is, can we give a high enough dose to really sterilize, let's say, the, the microenvironment or the tumor? Because because of the proximity of the bowel, we only give about 46 to 50 gray. And, the question is, is that going to be enough to do what you sort of wanted to do? I think that we can do that more safely now with IMRT, but I think that once again, it comes to the question of is it that dose enough? But again, in chemo prevention, you're not preventing all the cells from surviving. You're just preventing them from not killing the patient. In other words, we're all going to die. All the men in this room are going to die with prostate cancer in their prostate. Let, let's just face that. But most of us will not die of prostate cancer because we lived and other things happened. So the idea is, can we change the natural history so we take a man and we're not trying to sterilize them from not having one last cancer cell, but we change the outcome on that patient. So I was going to turn it around a little bit. Is there an animal model that you would be able to explore in, in terms of that? And, you know, I, 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 unless Da Vinci sponsors it, we're probably not going to take out all the lymph nodes of, of everybody over 50. But on the other hand, if there are models to study it, it seems like it'd be perfect to well, be able to do that. Well, that was one of the shocks. Let me come back. That was one of the shocks when we first started getting fluorescent proteins. We could take cells, human xenograft tumors, which could grow up to be these nice primary tumors and kill the host because the animal died of boredom, but it didn't die of metastases, okay? So what ends up happening is we labeled those cells. And what we found paradoxically is very early on, cells left the primary, went to the brain, went to the kidney, went to the liver, all over the place, constantly. So the idea of cells getting out was not the issue. Mm -hmm. Those cells, however, did not clonally expand. They stood there as basically green single cells. And we could actually resect the primary and come back months later and still find cells in the lung and in the liver mm -hmm. and the kidney. But the animal could go to its natural death, and it never developed macroscopically detected lesions. So just getting out isn't a story. Yeah, and, and actually I was citing similar data from right. Seattle with Paul Wang right. uh, initially, where there's a lot of dissemination and not a lot of growth. Well, let me come back to that. That's a very important point. So early on, if you think about it backwards, historically, when PCR came along, happy days are here again. All we got to do is take serum from men, right, after they've had a radical prostatectomy, and just do PCR, nested PCR amplification for, our, for basically PSA. PSA is the most, it's, it's been maligned, but it's the most specific marker I know of any tissue. There's three log order difference between the expression in normal and cancer versus any other normal tissue. So it's a phenomenally specific marker. So the problem with it was not that the men who had radicals were trying to predict which ones had micrometastatic disease, but when they started following men, they had men that were, had the prostates taken out and they were positive in their serum but they never relapsed. They didn't have biochemical recurrence, and they quote, but remember at that time, the gold standard was five-year survival. So we don't know. Now we've got men. In our autopsy series at Hopkins, we have men who for 18 years after their radical were fine. They were in their you know, early 50s, and they're now at 72, 73, and they're getting bad disease and dying. So in that study, we might have been able to find them by finding out that they had PSA detectable situations after their prostate had been taken out. Now, what would we have done with those men? I don't know. But I've always wondered if anybody's got an old <laughs> archival tissue bank to actually go back and look to see how predictive, actually, after a radical, of how predictive PSA mRNA actually is. Because that's going to be, in a sense, the tripwire. I mean, you know you got something then, right? And you can file that. But, but, but don't be surprised if somebody has that and they don't seem to you know, progress. 
because that could again be the immune system. 